So there's been a lot of speculation in regards to AMD's next generation CPU and GPU architectures. How powerful will they be? How efficient? How affordable? We're going to answer all those questions in this video, so stay tuned. Recall AMD's previous GPU naming scheme. The Southern Islands, which was based on the Radon HD 7000 series, included graphics cards such as the 7870, 7950, and 7990. You may recall the codename Tahiti used to describe in particular the 7950 and 7970. These were later rebranded as the R9 280 and 280X respectively. The Hawaii GPU, famous for its extraordinary thermal output and inclusion into the 290, 290X, and 390 series cards, was a part of AMD's Volcanic Islands family. Now in this case, AMD has decided to change things up a bit. Originally dubbed the Arctic Islands, AMD's next generation graphics cards will include GPUs named after stars and constellations, hence the familiar name Polaris. The Polaris family will include the next phase of R, the RX 400 series. Expect to hear graphics cards similar to R7 470 and R9 490 later this year. Each card will include HDMI 2.0a support, which on top of supporting 4K at up to 60fps, will also include HDR support and higher contrast values in games and movies. The cards will also feature H.265 support, which will allow 4K content encoding at up to 60fps as well. H.265 will aid in the card's ability to interpret 4K footage in particular by eliminating color washing and increasing complexity area control. Basically it just makes your image look a little better. DisplayPort 1.3 will also be a standard on these cards. Polaris is also an extremely efficient 14 nanometer design. A recent AMD event showcased a prototype graphics card equipped with a Polaris GPU running Star Wars Battlefront in 1080p with medium settings at 60fps. It only drew 86 watts of power compared to the 140 watts required by Nvidia's GTX 950 for the same experience. That's a 61% increase in efficiency between the two cards. Quite impressive. AMD hopes to bring virtual reality to the forefront in gaming and have noted that their minimum VR spec graphics cards will likely be under the $350 US dollar range. Currently, the GTX 970 and R9 390 graphics cards are the bare minimum for VR gaming, so expect Polaris to replace and improve upon the 390 at around the same price point. The performance figures for even the most powerful cards in the Polaris lineup are unfortunately still entirely unknown, though the R9 Nano and Fury X will likely be superseded in terms of performance and performance per watt. Now, what do we know about Zen? If you aren't familiar, Zen is the codename given to the next generation microarchitecture for AMD CPU lineup. It will replace the excavator architecture, which was the last revision of the bulldozer family, made famous most notably by the FX6300. All Zen CPUs will utilize the AM4 socket and be built on a 14 nanometer process, a significant step forward from the 32 and 28 nanometer processes of the FX CPUs and A series APUs. Only DDR4 will be supported by Zen, although the next generation APUs, which will also use the unified AM4 socket, will support both DDR3 and DDR4. In terms of performance, the IPC, or Instructions Per Clock, which is a measurement of CPU performance, of a single Zen core has improved by 40% over that of an excavator core, according to AMD. For comparison, Intel's newest CPU architecture, Skylake, received only a 6% IPC increase from Haswell, the 4000 series, and a 3% increase from Broadwell, the 5000 series. An IPC is typically expressed as a ratio, that is, a percent increase or decrease from a baseline value. While not always accurate, an IPC can be used to directly estimate scores in CPU-intensive tasks such as Cinebench R15. For example, given only a 6% IPC increase from Haswell to Skylake and a single-core Cinebench R15 score of 120 for the Haswell processor, one should expect the Skylake CPU single-core score to end up around 127, all other things equal. These estimates, however, can be inaccurate if different generations of RAM are used between the platforms in question or if core count or core clock speeds are different. So how will Zen perform head-to-head -head against Haswell or Skylake CPUs? Well, if we take AMD's claim at face value that Zen will perform about 40% better than Excavator, this means that it will perform about 65% better than Bulldozer in CPU-intensive tasks. However, Intel's Ivy Bridge IPC was already 55% higher than Bulldozer's when both architectures were released in 2012. From Ivy Bridge to Haswell, IPC increased by 11%. This means that Haswell's IPC is roughly 66% higher than Bulldozer's and, according to this math, literally on par with Zen, 66% versus 65%.
I should note that other sources list smaller IPC gains between Ivy Bridge and Haswell. The estimates range anywhere between 5% and 15%, so this means that Zen's per-core instruction speed could be anywhere between 7% slower and 3% faster than Haswell's. In terms of Skylake, its IPC improvement over Haswell was very small, about 6% if you recall from a bit earlier. This means that in relation to Skylake, Zen could have an IPC anywhere from 13-3% to lower than Skylake's. It's actually not bad. This in combination with simultaneous multi-threading, similar to hyper-threading on Intel's side, up to 64 PCIe lanes, and core counts up to even 16 as speculated by a few sites, should pose quite a threat to Intel's current lineup. And it's about time. This could leave big impressions on the microprocessor industry. Some serious competition from AMD could once again spark the consumer CP races from the early 2010 decade and prompt various price cuts all across the industry. DDR4 prices could continue to fall, and Skylake compatible motherboards will likely dip further in price to better compete with AMD's likely already competitive price point. Both Polaris and Zen look very promising from my personal perspective here in the studio, but I want to hear from you. Be sure to let me know in the comments below if you will consider products from either of these lineups. Additionally, if you want to start discussions, ask questions, or even help out fellow YouTubers with their tech-related problems, be sure to do all of those things in the comment sections below as well. I greatly appreciate that. If you liked the video, be sure to let me know by clicking the like button, and if you love the video, click that subscribe button. Why not? What can go wrong, right? This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.